In today's video, we're going to analyze the definition of products in category theory by doing a little bit of category theory to it. I'll explain what I mean by that in just a second, but first let me just recall the usual definition of product. So, if we have a category C and two objects A and B, then we say that a product of A and B is an object in C together with a map from that object into A and a map from that object into B. So, in other words, a diagram that looks something like this. And that diagram has to have the property that for any object gamma of C uh, that has a map from gamma into A and from gamma into B, then there's a unique map from gamma into the product object, usually called the pairing of the two maps out of gamma, for which both of the triangles in this uh, diagram commute. It turns out that this property uniquely determines the product diagram, if it indeed exists, up to a unique structural isomorphism. So it's safe to call it the product of A and B, and we usually write A times B for the object, and pi1 and pi2 for the maps, which we call projection. Now, I think what people like about this definition is that it's totally elementary. You can parse it the moment you know what a category is. But if you want to prove anything about products, or even guess whether it might be true, like that they're unique up to isomorphism or associative up to isomorphism, then you basically just have to unfold definitions and calculate. But since the selling point of category theory is that it's a good framework for organizing and analyzing mathematics, we can also use it to organize and analyze category theory itself. Let's start with a warm up idea. So you might have seen before that the product is essentially the, the largest span from A to B. So a span from A to B is just an object together with a map into A and a map into B. And uh, these form a category where the objects are, well, they're just spans. And the morphisms between two spans are a morphism between the chosen objects that's compatible with, or that commutes with, the chosen morphisms into A and B. That's all sensible enough. Then we can say that the product of A and B is a terminal object in the category of spans from A to B. In other words, it's an object in the category of spans to which every object in that category has a unique morphism. Right, so this may seem just like a more complicated version of the definition I gave at first, but, well, there are a few things that are nice about it. First of all, it draws attention to the fact that the product diagram and the input to the universal property, the gamma together with the map into A and into B, that those have the same shape. They're both spans from A to B. And by pursuing that idea further, we can get to the idea of limits and so on. So that's a, it's a very fruitful kind of direction to look. Another thing that's nice about it is that while well, terminal objects are unique up to unique isomorphism, in the simple sense that if you have two terminal objects in the same category, then, well, first of all, they're isomorphic, and second of all, they're isomorphic in exactly one way. That's pretty easy to prove, and if you know that, then you will see immediately that products, because they're terminal objects, they are also unique up to unique isomorphism of spans, in the sense that there's going to be exactly one isomorphism of spans, one isomorphism between the objects that commutes with the chosen projection morphisms between those two products. But today I want to talk about something else, maybe a, a more sophisticated analysis, which is uh, to instead look at what happens with HOM sets. So the definition of product that I gave at the start, it tells us that for every object gamma, there's an isomorphism of HOM sets. If we have a morphism from gamma to A and a morphism from gamma to B, then Pairing gives us a morphism from gamma into A times B. I mean, that's just what we said before. That's the existence part of the universal property or just the pairing part of the product structure. Conversely, if we have a map from gamma into A times B, then by post-composing with the projection maps, we can get a map from gamma into A and a map from gamma into B. Now, what if we start on the left with a pair of morphisms and we go to the right and then back to the left? Well, if we 
pair two morphisms and then postcompose with the projections, we get back out the two morphisms we started with. You may recognize these as the uh, beta laws of the product, but this is also just the fact that the, the two triangles commute, that if you pair and then project, you get back out what you started with. And finally, if you started at the right with a morphism from gamma to a times b, and then you went to the left and back to the right, well, that would mean that you postcomposed by both projections and then paired those back up. And you might recognize that as the eta law of products, and this round trip is the identity due to the uniqueness condition on the universal property, that there's exactly one such map that makes uh, these triangles commute, and both p and the pairing of pi 1p and pi 2p make these triangles commute. Therefore, they're equal. So if we just pause here for a moment, we can kind of distill all of this into the following slogan, that maps into a times b are the same as, or isomorphic to, pairs of maps into a and maps into b. And basically the, the punchline of this video will be that you can actually take this as the definition of the product if you phrase it in the right way. So the first thing I want to do is look at the relationship between the different HOM sets. So we said for every gamma we have you know, maps from gamma into A, maps from gamma into B, maps from gamma into A times B. So what's the relationship between the maps from gamma into A times B and the maps from delta into A times B for two objects, gamma and delta? Well, if we have a map from gamma into A times B and we have a map from delta to gamma, then we can actually get a map from delta into A times B just by composing those maps. And it turns out that the maps from blank into A times B is a functor where the morphism part of the functor is given by precomposition. We can see that this is a functor because precomposition by the identity is the identity, and precomposing twice is the same as precomposing once by a composite. If you watched my previous video on presheaves, uh, you'll remember that this is in fact the Yoneda embedding of A times B, the functor of maps into A times B. Similarly, the other side of our isomorphism on the previous slide was the set of maps into A times maps into B, and this will also be a functor by precomposition, and it turns out this is actually the product in the presheaf category of the Yoneda embedding of A and the Yoneda embedding of B. So now that we see that the maps into A times B and the pairs of maps into A and into B are presheaves, that they're functorial in the choice of object, the next question is whether the pointwise isomorphism between these two sets is also functorial, whether it's compatible with the functorial action. So in other words, if you precompose by theta and then you pair, or if you pair and then precompose by theta, or similarly with projection, do those diagrams commute? You can basically just check this by chasing things around the diagram. So if you start at the upper left and you pair and then precompose, or if you precompose and then pair, you'll see that those two results have to be equal by the uniqueness of the map into products. If you start on the upper right and you project and then precompose both, or if you precompose and then project, you'll see that those two have to be equal simply by the fact that some diagrams have to commute. So just to sum up where we've gotten, so supposing we start with a product of A and B, we get a pointwise isomorphism for every gamma, we have an isomorphism between pairs of maps from gamma into A and gamma into B with single maps from gamma into A times B. And in fact, we saw that we have something stronger than this. We have a natural isomorphism, a functorial assignment of isomorphisms, between the presheaf of pairs of maps into A and maps into B with the presheaf of maps into A times B. In other words, we have an isomorphism in the presheaf category between the product of Yoneda A and Yoneda B with Yoneda of A times B. And it turns out that from this, we can actually recover the original data of the product between A and B. Now, to see why that is, the, the trickiest part is actually going to be recovering the original projection maps. 
supposing that we have a map from Yoneda A times B into Yoneda A times Yoneda B, we can post compose by the pre sheaf projections into Yoneda A and Yoneda B, and then we'll get maps from Yoneda A times B into Yoneda A and into Yoneda B. Now, the Yoneda embedding is a fully faithful functor. I talked about this last time. And all that means is that if you have a map from Yoneda X to Yoneda Y, it has to be of the form Yoneda of something. The map from Yoneda A times B into Yoneda A has to be of the form Yoneda of a map in the original category from A times B to A. And that's going to be the first projection map. And we get the second projection map in exactly the same way. So if we have an isomorphism between Yoneda A times Yoneda B and Yoneda A times B, then we can recover the product by, well, the map from left to right is a natural transformation. And if we look at the gamma component, we will get a map from hom gamma to A times hom gamma to B into hom gamma to A times B. That's going to give us the pairing. The projection maps are what we did on the previous slide. And the fact that the triangles commute, or the beta law, and the fact that the pairing map is unique, the eta law, those are going to come from unpacking the components of the natural isomorphism, as I talked about a while ago. And that's it. So if we go back to our slogan that maps into A times B are the same as pairs of maps into A and maps into B, well, we can render that categorically as saying that the maps into A times B, aka the Yoneda embedding of A times B, that is isomorphic as a presheaf to the product of the Yoneda embedding of A, the presheaf of maps into A, with the Yoneda embedding of B, the presheaf of maps into B. So I basically want to conclude there. Let me just make a couple quick observations and then sum up. So first of all, the product of Yoneda A and Yoneda B always exists in the presheaf category, but this product might not be representable. It's only representable if the product of A and B actually exists in the base category. This is actually the categorical version of uh, logical frameworks, if you've heard of those. This is just saying that we always have a meta product in the pre sheaf category, and if we have products in the base category, they are internalizing the meta product. Building off of this, if the product of Yoneda A and Yoneda B is representable, it can only be representable in one way. If we have an object C such that Yoneda C is isomorphic to Yoneda A times Yoneda B, then as we just saw, C is the object part of the product of A and B, and the isomorphism also determines the projection parts. If we also have C prime, where Yoneda C prime is isomorphic to Yoneda A times Yoneda B, then there's exactly one isomorphism between Yoneda C and Yoneda C prime, which by the full faithfulness of Yoneda, means that there's exactly one isomorphism between C and C prime in the base category. And you can see that that isomorphism preserves the choice of projection maps. In general, it will come up a lot that there's some presheaf, and it turns out to be isomorphic to Yoneda of some object. And when that happens, we call that object the representing object of the presheaf, that there's a single object whose representable functor is that presheaf up to isomorphism. Finally, the uniqueness of the pairing map, the Eta law, was very important to the story I told today. So if you didn't have that, we actually wouldn't get some of the naturality for free. You can go back and see where we used it. But whereas in syntax, people often think of Eta laws as something complicated, in category theory, Eta laws actually greatly simplify the situation. It's more complicated to explain what a connective is when it doesn't have an Eta law. Now, I realize that if you haven't seen these ideas before, they probably went by way too fast. But if you take one thing away from this video, I, I want it to be the idea that none of these definitions were random. They all hang together and inform each other. And the more category theory you learn, the more you can start to build this kind of conceptual network in your mind where there are actually very few unique concepts in category theory, even though at the start, it seems like the entire subject is just a long list of concepts. In the case of products, by passing to the presheaf category, you can see that you can really take the naive concept of product as its definition, provided you phrase it correctly. 
In fact, a great deal of concepts in category theory can be understood as representing objects for various precies. And in a future video, I'll talk about how right adjoints are just representing objects. And if I make enough of these, I'll even talk about how univalent universes are representing objects, if you can believe that. But for now, thanks for watching, smash that follow button, and let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. Bye.